Okay, so um, we left off uh, naming the conjugate base or the product of carboxylic acids when they get neutralized. So if you remember, we talked about methanoic acid. And do you remember what I said about the mouse? What did I say? Chase is the white mouse. <laughs> Chase is the cheese. Oh, my God. <laughs> the white mouse ate icky cheese, right? So... Ick and eight. For the carboxylic acids, you only have to worry about the ick and the eight. And so, ick, so if it's a methanoic acid, it's conjugate base, this is Bronsted Lowry, that is when it's neutralized, becomes known as methanoate. So you take the ick of the name, like this. Ooh, that's a funny color. Can't see it either. Hmm. How about this color? Is that better? Still not that good, huh? I'll just stick with red. So the ick, none of them show up good. It's the projector. Becomes the product, eight. And in the neutralization reaction that we had talked about before, right, the sodium that was part of the sodium hydroxide becomes part of the conjugate base. So when we name this, we would call this sodium methanoate. Anybody know why we put sodium first? Because it's a salt, and when you name ionic compounds, what's always first? The metal comes first, right? So it's from naming a, a inorganic compounds, we put the sodium in the front. So benzoic acid, when it's neutralized, right? The hydrogen's removed, we make water from that hydrogen, and then if it's with potassium hydroxide, we would call that potassium benzoate. Any questions about that? It's important that you get this part of the nomenclature because when we talk about esters, we base the name of the ester off of this. Okay, so it's gonna get used later. I have a little flow chart later to help us through that whole thing. And then I becomes? Us. Yeah. yeah. Do you have an example of that? Oh, well, since we're not dealing with it, it's kind of funny. In Chem 3A, it was like a big deal. Like here, we hardly ever do it. So just worry about it. Just worry about the eights and the icks, yeah. Okay. So uh, carboxylate salts is what we call these. So that's anything that looks like R, remember what R stands for? The rest of the molecules, so you don't have to worry about whatever it is, okay? C, a couple of ways that you can write it. Say it's like that, okay? Carboxylate salts, right, are very soluble in water. Why do you think they're really soluble in water? Because it says, yeah, it has the charges like it does, and water is very polar, and so it dissociates in water completely. So carboxylate salts tend to be very soluble in water. Okay. Now, at room temperature, so solubility, right, ionic, soluble in water. But the other thing that they have is very high melting points. High melting points, because they are ionic, the charges are really strongly attracted to each other, so they, it takes a lot of energy to get those ions to melt apart from each other. Which means at room temperature, most carboxylate salts are solids. Okay? So thinking about the way I'm thinking about it, right? Carboxylate salts have, are ionic, so they dissolve in water well. They're ionic, so they're strongly attracted to each other. It takes a lot of energy to melt them. High temperatures, so room temperature is not a high temperature, right? So that means at room temperature, they're usually solid. So all that information goes together. Now there's a sign in, it'll be up here if you were late. Or just do it after class, it's fine. Any questions about those things? Uh, carboxylate salts that we use in the lab a lot are sodium and potassium ones, just because they're soluble 
easily, we can get them easy. You can have lithium salts too, but sodium and potassium tend to be pretty soluble and easy to get. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this. This is a preservative thing in the benzoate thing. I talked about it already. And this is our friend MSG. Where's the carboxylate end of this? It's on the right side, right? So MSG has a carboxylate ion on the right. Over here. Oops, wow. circle. Cool. Yep, back. How did I lose that so fast? I just pushed a billion buttons all at once. Has a carboxylate group at this end. What's on the other end? The less side is still in the acidic form, right? What would happen if I neutralize this one more time then? Yeah, on the left side, it's an acid. You would take, if you neutralize this one more time, so just like NaOH or KOH, this side of the molecule would look like this. And it would be, uh, an, it would have a two minus charge as a carboxylate ion. Okay. Yeah, then it would be disodium glutamate. Or they might just say sodium glutamate, but I, it probably knowing the way it's named, disodium is probably what they would call it. Right. If you remember from your 3A nomenclature stuff, if you just say sodium from the charge of glutamate, they could tell that there's two on there. But still, a lot of times when you read this literature, it'll say disodium, even though you don't have to tell people that. And mostly because everybody's familiar with monosodium glutamate. So good. So we're going to do the reaction equation for propanoic acid and sodium hydroxide, and then we'll name the salt. Okay, so propanoic acid. Three carbons, good. Start with the parent chain. Oops. I cheated. It's on the next slide, but I'm going to write some notes on here. So you're going to start with, draw the structures. And you always start with the parent chain, and draw the parent chain. So it would be C, if you have this next slide, it's actually written, but it's good practice. CH2, C. Now, if you want, you can write it as COOH. I talked about there's different ways to write these. That's just a little easier to do, COOH. And then it's with sodium hydroxide. What will that do? What's one of the products always in these kinds of water? So start with the water. That's the one that's easy to remember. I'm going to change the color of my pen to black. There's an H and there's an OH. Those two come together to form the water. And then the other part, you're just going to take the metal. It's going to have a positive charge on it, and you're going to combine it with uh, the carboxylate ion. So to write the carboxylate ion, you just have to say plus CH3CH2COO minus. And then the metal ion will be Na plus. So this is propanoic acid. What's the name of its conjugate base? It, it, propanoate. Yeah. So this is eight. Oh, ic goes to eight. So propanoic. Propan. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> propanoate. 
Uh, and then if you, sorry, I didn't leave room for the metal line that should go in front. What should the, so I'm going to write sodium up here. And then the order goes like this, the sodium, the metal always goes first. Okay. So it'd be sodium propanoate. Yeah, so um, you're saying if I was writing it? Yeah, like how you wrote it out on the bottom? Yeah. Would be another NA in front of the H2O? Or no, the NA came from this OH yeah. here, right? Mm -hmm. So this is just NA and then this. Okay. And so you're writing in front of H2O again. Yeah, so the H2O could be over through here. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter which way it goes. I think I understood that. Okay. Questions? And then there's a neater version of it, the books. Okay. So, um, what's physiological pH? What's the pH? That's the number. I mean, remember? Five? What are you, some kind of animal? No. Like, if you were, if I were to take your blood, not that I'll do that. How about just fluid from your eye? Ooh. And measure the pH. What would it be? What's that? Wow, she got like exactly. Yeah, it's between though. Like roughly speaking, like between seven two and seven four. Somewhere in that range. That's kind of like the normal range. If you go very far outside the normal range, bad stuff happens. Okay, So typically it's around uh, on the, um, in the cell, outside the cell, it's like 7.4-ish. Yeah. 3.5 uh, is probably closer than 4.5. But 7.4-ish but we can go with. Okay. And then inside the cell, it's a little bit more acidic. It's 7.2. At that pH, most of the carboxylic acids in your body are deprotonated. Okay? That pH is high enough. Remember, carboxylic acids are acids, right? So they want, they, when you put them into something, they be, make the pH low. So they make things acidic. But when in your body, you have buffers like carbonate buffers and a bunch of things that regulate the pH relatively high. And so what ends up for relative to carboxylic acid. What ends up happening to carboxylic acids in your body is they tend to dissociate, and most of the time they're in this kind of carboxylate ion form. So succinic acid is one of these um, uh, acids that you'd find in your body as part of one of these different cycles that you have to memorize. It becomes the succinate ion in your body. Okay? So a general note... Carboxylic acids, this is kind of like more of a number thing. Carboxylic acids have, remember we talked about pKa's? pKa's of carboxylic acids are usually around 4.7 to 5. So we're just going to say pKa's, because for this kind of stuff it's not that critical, is around 5. Uh, acetic acids, 4.75. pKa is a measure of how strong the acid is. The lower the number, the more acidic. The higher the number, the less acidic that it is. So, yeah, so that means stronger acids. So low pKa's are strong. Neutral, like when we think pH, right, 10 to the minus 7, pH 7, that's like a neutral pH. It's not the same meaning, but pKa, same thing. If pH is low, it's more acidic. If the pKa is low, the acid's stronger. Okay? So if the pH is, in general, okay, if pH is greater than pKa, all your acids will be, whatever the acid is, will be deprotonated. It'll always be as its anion form. 
So since your physiological pH is around um, 7.2 intracellularly, that's within the cell, 7.4 extracellular, but anyways, let's call it 7.2. It's going to be greater than 5. That means it's almost always deprotonated. They say in your stomach, right, what's the, what's, what's the acid in your stomach? Huh? Well, not the pH. What's the acid of your stomach? They always say hydrochloric acid, right? pKa of hydrochloric acid is like minus 7. It's like really strong, like on this like crazy strong scale, right? So that's why in your stomach, when you have hydrochloric acid, really what you have is hydrogen ions and chloride ions. You don't have, you have chloride. You don't have HCl in your stomach. It's just dissociated because the pH, right, of your stomach, yeah, the pKa of the C, uh, hydrochloric acid is so low, it's always going to be dissociated. Can you repeat the note? Um, you said pH, if the pH is greater than the pKa, right, then the acid will be in its anion form, or it's and for carboxylic acids, it'll be in its carboxylate. Let me. I guess I could fit a note on the bottom of the screen today. That would be the same thing as the conjugate base, right? Yeah, it'll be as a, it'll be in its form of a conjugate base for the acids. Can you explain it in terms of the stomach again? Okay. okay, so like your stomach pH is two. Yeah. Right? The pKa of hydrochloric acid is minus seven. So the pKa is lower than the pH, so it's completely in its chloride form. That's why it's not together. Yeah, that's why it's not together. It's in its conjugate base form. Okay. The pKa is like the actual... How strong... pKa is the actual how strong the acid is. And the lower it goes, the stronger it is. Okay. It's kind of crazy to think how your stomach works. It pumps hydrogen ions into your stomach, and then chlorides just kind of come along with it, right? And then you can get little, you can take a little pill and it blocks the hydrogen ion pump and all your stomach problems go away. All right. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit um, is in relationship to some carboxylic acids and, and metabolism, we see a lot of oxidation reduction reactions. Uh, we'll cover some of this stuff in more detail at the end of the semester. This is pyruvate that's on this side. So it's got four carbons, right? It's got a, a carbonyl group over here as this ketone. And then what we're learning, at least, or have been learning, oxidation is creating more bonds to oxygen, and reduction is adding hydrogens, right? So one of the cofactors, or if you want to call, call it that, that is involved in a reduction of pyruvate is the NADH. And what happens with NADH is that the NADH picks up another hydrogen from water through an enzyme, okay, and then converts it to lactate. So this is the same as lactic acid, and it's part of your anaerobic metabolism, like when you don't get enough oxygen, right? And you'll notice what happens here. The oxygen that's double bonded over here has a single bond. And what have I added? Hydrogen. Two hydrogens. So if you know what the structure of pyruvate is and you get good at this idea of, oh, this step in the Krebs, uh, in anaerobic metabolism is a reduction, you don't have to remember like what the other structure is. If you can remember pyruvate, you just remember it's reduced. This is the reduction product. You just add a hydrogen to both ends, OK? OK, let's see. What else do I have? Um, here's another example. Um, it's a little harder to see, but this is an oxidation reduction. Um, these are other carbo examples of carboxylic acids. This is from the Krebs cycle. 
This is citric acid. Remember, citric acid is that stuff you get in like citrus. And it's, what is it? What do we use it for? It's the sour, like in the Sour Patch Kids, right? So that's what makes the sour flavor. This is citric acid. When, it get, when the oxidation reaction happens here, actually, this carbon gets converted into CO2. That's the easiest way to see that oxidation product. Okay, but again, these are carboxylic acids, or tri, this is a tricarboxylic acid, carboxylic acid group here, here, and here. This is also what in like uh, um, Mountain Dew gives it its citrusy flavor. It's got uh, citric acid in it. We'll skip that one. Okay. But it's more examples of oxidation reactions and carboxylic acids. So let's go ahead and look at the next section, which is esters. Um, I went ahead and left this slide in here. I think it's interesting. Uh, it's... So silicin is an ester, and it comes from willow tree bark. Um, the actually most interesting thing about this to me is not what's on the slide. The most interesting thing to me is that silicin, when your body gets it, gets convert to, converted to salicylic acid, and that relieves pain. Salicylic acid is uh, what we get when we take aspirin. We take acetosalicylic acid. So aspirin... Uh, reduces fever, uh, reduces pain, inflammation, swelling. That's not the most interesting part. The most interesting part of this to me is just kind of gross. Beavers eat willow trees, and then they concentrate the salicylic acid in this giant gland that they used for marking territory. And people used to use that gland as for pain reliever. Can you imagine just grinding up some beaver's gland and then just eating it? because you had a fever or a headache or, I don't know, anyways. I just thought that was interesting. Uh, yeah, so, so this stuff gets, uh, gets a lot of different uses, but you could take willow tree bark, literally steep it, make a tea out of it, and it's pain reliever, anti-fever. The only problem is if, if uh, you take too much of it, it, it does the same thing that ibuprofen does, uh, irritates your stomach lining. Yeah, it breaks down the mucus of your stomach lining. That's all related to biochemistry. Maybe we'll cover some of that in the end of the semester. Okay, so what's an ester? Well, an ester is derived from a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. So try to imagine it like this. This is the ester on the right. This is the carboxylate part, this part that I'll, let me circle it. This is the carboxylate part. And this is the part that looks like it comes from the alcohol. The oxygen that's there actually comes from the alcohol. Um, but you'll notice if I took ethanoic acid and combined it with methanol. Now, why did I say methanol? Because this has a CH3 group on it. I could make methyl ethanoate. This is the, an ester of ethanoic acid. Okay? Uh, they're cool compounds because uh, they smell good. So like right now, we're in the smell good phase of organic chemistry. Last week, we, or this week, we're doing aldehydes, right? Aldehydes are things like cinnamon and vanilla, almond. Um, what, were, what were the other ones? Butter? buttery flavor, that's ketones actually, but aldehydes and ketones are kind of nice. These ones all smell fruity. So like banana is one of the ones we made this last week. I don't know if when you went in the lab this week, you might have smelled the banana e smell in the room. We made the banana ester, okay? But uh, blackberries are very uh, commonly, uh, this, what we attribute to blackberries fruitiness is an ester. Oranges, strawberries, pears, pineapples, all that fruitiness that we get is all from esters. Typically, the way it's done is we just take the acid and then the corresponding alcohol, and we 
boil them. The fancy term in chemistry is reflux them together with some sulfuric acid, and then out comes the ester. Okay. Uh, the reaction is written like this, and this is known as a Fischer esterification. And you'll notice what happens in this reaction. There's the carboxylate group, the OH. That gets replaced by that, including the O. That means everything else that comes off, what does that make? Water. Makes a water. Yeah, it's not a very good color, is it? That makes this water that's over here. Okay. Oh, because it's attached by the oxygen, that's all. Right? Like if you did the Lewis structure for that, it would be C, hang on, C, O, and H like that. So that's why they do it. Yeah. All right, it requires a little bit of acid to make the reaction go faster, and then it requires, what's that? Triangle is heat, okay? Acid catalyst and heat. Remember when we talked about Fischer diagrams the other day? Same Fischer. All right. All right. It's actually what we call an equilibrium reaction. So if you had one mole of this and one mole of this, right, the reaction would go until you had about a half a mole and then you'd have about a half a mole of product. So that means that at equilibrium, like when the reaction's done, you'll have about half products, half reactants, okay? Do you guys remember Le Chatelier's principle? Le Chatelier's principle was the idea of, and this is, sounds really silly, when you put more reactants in, you get more products out, right? That's the simple way to explain Le Chatelier's principle. You can make an e reaction go further to the right just by putting more reactant in. And in this case, for example, if I added more of the acid, that would make the reaction go to the right. Or if I added more of the alcohol, that could also make the reaction go to the right. And I could get more product either way. Or you could add more both and get more product out. Okay. So this equilibrium reaction, uh, because people like to make esters, uh, is typically used by adding an excess reagent and then forcing the product to be formed from the reaction. Well, I think we're going to do this in a couple of weeks. We'll see. Okay, so what we want to do is draw the condensed structural formulas uh, for the following reactions. And the simple way to do it is just pull the water out and then reconnect the pieces. Okay? So I'll leave you, give you a second to do that, and then I'll do it. Sign in? Oh, I don't know where I went. Oh, she has it. You guys got the first one? So I'm going to start with my H and my C double bond O and then my and then I'll change colors. And then my OCH2CH3. And the other part that I'll get out of it are H and OH. Okay. So this is the ester. 
that you get from the react that first reaction. No, I just implied it by writing them next to each other, or you could write it out either way, yeah. Again, your test will probably be multiple choice, so you have to scan through and find the one that matches. And then sometimes if you get stuck on a test question, you have a choice and you think it's right, but you, like, you don't see the line that you think should be drawn there, feel free to come up and ask me. I may not tell you that's all that's the right answer, but doesn't hurt. I won't yell at you. I will the second time, but the first time I won't. So what's the Esther for the second one? All right, I didn't highlight it, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to get rid of an OH and an H like that. And so I can write. No, but I'm just like. In the actual reaction, the H and OH that take, get taken out are the ones I'm circling. Okay. Yeah, but if you don't, I mean, for you guys, you don't care. You just want to get the formula for the ester, so, okay. yeah, as long as you remember what, how it goes. But it is, it is, you know, for people in the other organic chemistry class, it is important to know, like, this O is the one that ends up in the ester. But for, the guy, for you guys in the, the, the organic biochemistry class, not that big a deal. What's that? This O, or she's in the other organic chemistry class. This O is the one that actually ends up attached to the carbon in the ester. Either way, you'll have an O, right? Yeah, either way, there's an O, and it doesn't for like for many, many, many years, I didn't know which O it was until they actually took radioactive elements and they make a radioactive alcohol and non-radioactive carboxylic acid, make the product and see where the radiation shows up. All right. What's that? Well, you'll have to learn that later. Because <laughs> if I said it now, it would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> but I'm glad you're curious. I'll explain it to you later. That's fine. So, uh, right, there's a, there's a time and place for everything, right, guys? So CH3, CH2, C double bond O, and then I want red for this part, O, and then CH3. And I left the line out, but it doesn't matter if the line's there or not. As long as they're next to each other, the line is implied. What do you think? It's the order that, so um, the, uh, the answer is it depends on who's grading it. <laughs> okay. Um, if you, oops, sorry. A lot of people would, and I probably would get a little bent out. If it's an H, and sometimes put, some put an H here and an O here, I'm like, well, it's not such a big deal. But like a CH3 is really on the end. So I'd much rather you guys learn to put them in this order. Uh, it doesn't matter, though, if you had, for some crazy reason, decided to do it like this. Not sure why you would do that, but uh, if you wanted to do that, it's okay, because it's written backwards is all. Yeah. Yeah. Up here? No. Yeah, right there. Is the OH always? No. It could, be. it could be either way, like it is here. Okay. Normally, when we do alcohols, honestly, I think this is why. Normally, when we do alcohols, we usually write it like this, because what's the alcohol functional group? OH, right? Nobody says, what's the alcohol functional group? Nobody says the other thing. <laughs> Sorry. You can sound it out in your head. But HO? Yeah. 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 Okay. This is actually salicylic acid. This is acetic acid. And if you combine these two things, you form this ester. 
This is acetosalicylic acid, right? Say that really fast, like 10 times, acetosalicylic acid. Uh, in the abbreviations in a lot of, in a lot of uh, lab reports and stuff, people usually just say ASA because it's a lot easier to say that than write out acetosalicylic acid all the time. Uh, but this is the active ingredient in aspirin, and you can see the ester in it, right? Where's the ester? It's formed from this alcohol in this guy here, and it's this guy right here. So that's the ester. Uh, phenols are relatively caustic, so this is a phenol with a carboxylic acid group on it, right? This phenols are typically very irritating, and so that's one of the reasons why, like, you could take salicylic acid if you had a fever or a headache. It's just eventually it would be very irritating to your stomach. Um, yeah, let's, oh, I'll skip this one. I'll just do that one in lab. Skip that one. We have to name them now. You took like a tums. I took if a ton. Like if tums. you were taking salicylic acid. A ton of it. Okay. If you took tums. Tums. Like balance it out. No. No. Would it work? It's not the ear. Okay. <clears throat> Hang on. This is probably really irrelevant. I'm just wondering. No, it's a good wonder. Like, I wonder if I could, um, kind of thing. So, just to, so there's an enzyme that's called cyclooxygenase, and cyclooxygenase is distributed into your body. And there's like at least five different forms of it. And depending on where it is in your body, it takes um, uh, molecules. I'll just put it like that that come from um, either cell walls breaking or other things, and converts them into molecules that we represent in our bodies as swelling, inflammation, pain, and things like that. Uh, one version of this enzyme, though, is in your stomach lining, and it produces the mucus in your stomach. And what happens when you take aspirin or you take ibuprofen, it blocks that um, enzyme from functioning, and so you have, do you ever wonder why, I mean, this is one of those things that took me years to think about, do you ever wonder why your stomach doesn't just digest itself? Well, yeah, because it's inactive, it's an inactive form. Well, you have this mucus lining in your stomach that keeps the acid from, like, chewing away at your stomach. And so what the, what the aspirin does, or the ibuprofen do, is they block that enzyme that helps to produce that mucus, and then as a result, what happens? You don't have that protective lining on your stomach anymore, and then you start eating holes in your stomach. So you literally just digest yourself. And that's an ulcer. So that's what happens when you take too much ibuprofen? Yeah, I take too much ibuprofen. It's not really the ibuprofen itself that's irritating your stomach. It's that what it does to the enzyme that produces that mucus. And it's a cyclooxygenase enzyme. And it's like distributing your body all kinds of different places. So like they actually, some of the stuff I've read, like there's a different cyclooxygenase in your head than in your stomach, than is in like your muscles and joints and tissues. And so what happens is if you take one kind of pain reliever, it may only be acting on one kind of um, receptor or enzyme, and that causes only effects in that one area. So you might have a brain headache, and you might take one thing and it might work, but then you might have a stress headache and you take like ibuprofen and that works, but then Tylenol doesn't work, you know. So there's a lot of like people, some people say, oh, I always take this for my headache. Well, it depends on the kind of headache you have. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you stop taking it, will it heal itself? If you stop taking it, will it heal itself? I don't know. I hope so. Oh, yeah, it should start, but I don't know how well it would heal itself. I've had some stomach issues in my past because maybe I drink too much coffee and I stress out a lot. Um, but um, I've always taken uh, like a Tagamet, an acid blocker, and, and that stops the acid production for a while, and then I lay off the ibuprofen and stuff at the same time. And then within a couple of days, I feel fine. So what about like something that has caffeine in it? like a pill that would have caffeine in it, does that just increase your blood pressure? Yeah, I don't rate? know how that works. Oh, well, yeah, it increase your heart yeah, rate and your blood pressure. Yeah. Basically have it work faster or... Mm, do I don't know about that. Yeah. You go ask your doctor that. <laughs> <laughs> like, doctor, I want to take caffeine because I have a stomach ache. Is that a good idea? He'll probably say no. <laughs> well, I know, like, a headache, you can drink, they 
say drink like a cup of coffee? Yeah, well, caffeine it has some analgesic properties to it. So, oh, okay. yeah. Well, and also you might have a headache because you're addicted to coffee and maybe you didn't. Well, oh, yeah, that's right. That is the thing. But the other thing is most of the time when you have a coffee headache, like I think half the time people are just dehydrated. And a lot of times I'll just drink warm water and I feel better. I'm like, oh, it wasn't coffee. It was just dehydration. Although today I've already had like four or five cups. It's been a bad day. Right. Okay, so let's go. Oh, sorry. So um, what we're going to do, just notice this name real quick, ethyl butanoate. This is pineapple um, odor. By the way, butanoate is the, is the carbox, butanoic acid is the carboxylic acid that smells like sweaty feet. Yeah, or rancid butter. Yeah, so, um, but when you, when you reflux it, when you boil it with uh, ethyl alcohol and a little bit of acid, it creates a pineapple smell. So it's kind of one of those, like, oh, that's really cool, but then if you smell it before it's done, it's really awful. It smells like a bottle of sweaty feet. So, uh, notice in the name, this is the butanoate part, okay? So that's the butan part. That's the, the name of the carboxylate, okay? And then this, the alcohol is in the front. So the, in the naming, just the basic structure of the name, what you do is you take and put the name of the alcohol in the front as a substituent, and then you name the carboxylate ion. That's basically how the name is put together. So we see it like this with the alcohol, what came from the alcohol on the right, but in the name, it's always the first thing. This is already combined. Yeah, it's already combined. Oh, okay. So I'm going to show you. I made a flow chart for you to do these naming things. That's on the next slide. So we're going to name this. And I, I went all the way through the whole naming thing and to show you why you need to know how to name a carboxylic acid and then it's, it's, it's a conjugate base, okay? So that's four carbons, right? So you start with the name butane and to get the name of the acid, you get rid of the E and you put the OIC, right? So... Name of the carbox, so we get the name butane, we get rid of the E, so it becomes butanoic acid, okay? And then we get rid of the ick, all right, and put, leave an O, so you see what happened? The O gets left behind, and then you add eight. What's that? You remove the word acid from it. Yeah, you get rid of the word acid too. Yeah, that goes all. Yeah, that goes right away. So start with butane. You name the acid, and then to name the carboxylate, the, the way it's done is you take the name of the acid, get rid of the ick, and then you put the eight at the end. Okay. I didn't say that you leave the O there before, but the O gets left in there. So this chart will tell you how to name both the acid and its conjugate base, okay? And then to name the alkyl group, all you do is say it's propane, so that's propyl, as a substituent, and just becomes propyl butanoate, okay? So start with the carboxylate, take the number of carbons in it, okay? Convert it to its acid name, convert it to its carboxylate name, and then add, add the alkyl group into the front of the name. Practice, practice, practice. Okay, we're going to practice, okay? So I... I uh, Made three. Did I say common names on here? Oh, I did. I hate that. Okay, so we'll do the four. We'll do the IUPAC names.
first. What's the first step? Parent chain. Parent is considered to be not the one with the most carbons. It's the one that has the carboxylate group on it. Okay, so this is my parent. Oops, let me do this again. This is my parent. So how, how many carbons? So it's ethane, right? And that becomes ethanoic, and that becomes ethano eight. Okay, so that's the process. Ethane, get rid of the E, add OIC, get rid of the IC, add ATE. You practice it four or five times, it'll become a pattern and it won't be so horribly deep, mystical and frightening. Oh, that's just the name of the parent now. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, we're not done yet. What's the other part? Ethyl. Ethyl. Yay, that one was easy. Ethyl. Ethan. No eight. What? Because there's two. One, two. One, two. Would it be correct if you would say diethane or methane? What? No. Can't do that. I don't think. What? Say what you said again. And so can the ethyl ethanoate be put diethanoate? No. Yeah, it's two ethyls, but one's a carboxylic acid, one comes from an alcohol, so it's like different. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's do the bottom one. The parent is this. Now, that one you just have to know is benz benzoic acid, it comes from benzoic acid, so it's benzoate. It comes from benzoic acid. And now we call it benzo-8. By the way, I got this thing to record. It's not going to stop anymore, I think. Close my fingers. And then what's, what's this? It's not just ethyl anymore, is it? It's got a group on it. So let me explain to you how you do this. Where, where it's attached to the ester, that's the number one carbon. Okay. And so this becomes one, two, and that has a chlorine on it, right? So it's two chloroethyl. Why is it two chloro instead of three chloro? Um, oh, because this is the one carbon, this is the two carbon, and this has to be this has to be attached to that. Yeah, I know a lot of people see the C of the CL and think that's the third carbon, right? Yeah. No, this happens all the time in every class that I teach, and I try to say, hey, no, don't do that. But now you know. It's good you asked. So 2-chloro, right? And it's on an, if it had been like ethane, like 2-chloroethane, that would have been the name. So now it's 2-chloroethyl. So 2-chloroethyl benzoate. Okay, so questions. So you got to be a little bit careful. If, if the alkyl group has a substituent on it, you number from the end attached to the oxygen and just tell people where that other thing is. If that hadn't been there, it would have just been ethyl benzoate. But since there's a chlorine on there, you just have to say where that chlorine group is. Okay, this one, what's this? It's, yeah, butane and butanoic, 
and butanoate. So just to keep consistent, butane. Sorry, botched that a little bit. A benzoic? Yes. Benzoate. Yes. Benzoate? Sorry. That's one you just have to kind of know. Yeah. It's one of the accepted IUPAC names. So this is butane, then butanoic, and then butanoic. No eight. So that's the parent. What is that thing on the right? What's the alkyl group called? Methyl ethyl, one methyl ethyl, or isopropyl. Either one's acceptable. So now I would choose isopropyl just because it's easier than one methyl ethyl. <laughs> All right, so isopropyl butanoate. Isopropyls are always going to be with the methane connected to the thing? Yeah, uh, an isopropyl is always a branched in the middle. I mean, it's connected to the central carbon of three. But remember, the branch is always, in any iso group, the branch is always one from the end. So we talked about like isopentyl. This is one, two, three, four. That would be isopentyl. And if, ignore the numbers. I just was trying to verify that I had the right number there. But oh, I erased everything. I need the pen back. Okay, it's always branched one from the end. Okay, you also have to draw structures from names. That's almost easier. So propyl pentanoate. So what are you going to do? Parent. Draw the parent first. Five carbons. I'm going to do, uh, what do you want me to do, bond line, or do you want me to write CHs out? CHs. All right, I'll draw CHs. C, oh, and then I'll switch slides on you real quick. C H three C H two C H two C H two and then have to have the C double bond O and O and propyl is what three Well, I'll do that in a second. One of the things I wanted to point out though is a lot of times when people do these structures from the names, they don't include this carbon, and so they end up having only four carbons in the chain. So always make sure you include this carbon when you're counting, okay? That last carbon doesn't have any hydrogens on it, so it sometimes gets people in trouble because I think that doesn't not part of the parent. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. So I'm going to do the bond line. Um, I should have five carbons, right? So I start with one, two, three, four, five. That's my five carbons. Make sure I got that one, two, three, four, five. And then I need a double bonded oxygen here, another oxygen there, and then three more carbons. So I would start on the oxygen and go one, two, three. So make sure that your structure has as many bends as it has carbons, right? Unless it's an oxygen on a bend, but it's marked as an oxygen, so you shouldn't count it. So like here, right, I have, starting with the end, one, two, three, four, five, that's the five, and here I have one, two, and Um, ethyl propionate. What's propy stand for? Common name for three, right? 
Yeah. So you're going to go, if I do bond line, I would go one, two, three. And then I'm drawing the parent first. That's the parent. And then I just have an ethyl group to it. So how many groups in ethyl? Two, two carbons in ethyl on me. One, two, like that. C's and H's. CH3, CH2, CH. Oops, sorry. Got carried away. C, double bond O, O, and then CH2, CH3. Whew. Any questions? Um, Practicing? Did you want us to do the, um, the like, If I ask you to write it out for sure, and when you're practicing on homework, you should do that. But what if we just want to like, just go straight to Pinderwick? That's fine. If I don't ask for the stuff in between, don't give it to me. Yeah. But I would say. 90% of people want to do the stuff in between. So, but yeah, whatever makes you happy is fine with me. Unless I ask for it, then you don't give it to me. Then that doesn't make me happy. I'm going to skip esters and fruits. We'll fiddle with that in the lab. This is the na guide to naming esters the book gave you. I just left the slides in there. So, All right. One more part. A lot of stuff. Yeah. Esters aren't too bad. Esters aren't bad. Okay, so remember what we always do. We always do uh, property. We do, we'll have some react. We do properties. We do names. Did names of carboxylic acids. We did names of esters. We do properties. So we did properties of carboxylic acids, right? We still have to do properties of esters. We've already done the reactions, though, so we're pretty much clear on that. So um, the, this was one of the ones from earlier. This is known as ethyl acetate. Ethyl acetate is the common name for a type of fingernail polish remover that, that you, uh, other than that, if you don't get acetone, you're usually getting ethyl acetate. Uh, you smell it in paints and stuff a lot. Um, what are its properties? Well, carboxylic acids, you remember, had really high boiling points. Esters don't have boiling points that are quite as high. If you look at esters, alkanes, alcohols, um, and carboxylic acids that have about the same molecular weight, so you notice these all have about the same molecular weight. Right. Butane has the lowest boiling point because it doesn't have, any, uh, doesn't have any intermolecular forces other than van der Waals or dispersion. And the highest is always carboxylic acids. Why do carboxylic acids have high boiling points and melting points? Yes. Yeah, very polar groups. And those OHs hydrogen bond with each other and they form the dimers that we talked about. So try to remember that. That's an important point. Okay, so hydrogen bonding, very polar, form dimers. Okay, esters can't do that because they don't have a hydrogen bonding group, okay? So they don't have the hydrogen bonding group, so their boiling points are going to be relatively low compared to carboxylic acids. And alcohols, right, alcohols have hydrogen bonding, so they're going to be a little bit higher boiling points. So if you're comparing things with similar molecular weights, it always goes alkanes, esters, alcohols, and then carboxylic acids. And the two end groups you can remember, right? Alkanes are always low. Carboxylic acids are always high. And then the other two you could sort of sort out based on hydrogen bonding. So that one is hydrogen bonding. Okay. Ooh. Bunch of slides. Any questions? We're okay on that? Properties are some of the properties after you've looked at the naming and all that. Properties is kind of nice because it's kind of like, oh, I can remember that. Okay. 
Esters, uh, sort of like uh, carboxylic acids and alcohols, right? Five carbons are soluble. Uh, anything more than that, the solubility decreases. So most of these things, if you have to remember generalities, most organic compounds up that have hydrogen bonding or are very polar are soluble up to about five carbons, and then after that it just drops off as they get more carbons on. When you do solubility in water, too, this oxygen, even though the carboxylate group is not there on an ester, it still does have the oxygen on it, and so these oxygens can hydrogen bond with water, and so that's what gives it its higher solubility, or high, high, gives it good solubility, let's put it that way. Uh, if you take an ester and you add water to it, okay, and you heat it, it decomposes back into the alcohol and the carboxylic acid that you made it from. Remember, the first time when we talked about the Fischer esterification, it was the acid plus the alcohol makes the ester, right? And what was the other product? Acid plus alcohol makes the ester plus water. If you start with the ester and you put water in there, it just decomposes and gives you the original molecules back, okay? So this is actually, if you go back and look in your slides, this is actually the, the reaction that I gave you earlier in reverse. Okay. Uh, it says acid catalysts and heat are required, but usually there's just enough acid in there that it decomposes on you. Okay. All right. Here's the example. If you have aspirin, and you store it for a long time, it starts to smell funny, okay? That's because a little bit of moisture gets into the container and it begins to decompose. The ester decomposes, okay? So if I was to decompose this ester, okay, this one here, what would the products be? So let's back up. I want to go back to the previous slide, okay, and, and go over this in more detail. This group will come off, okay? The, 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 al the part that becomes the alcohol will come off. So this goes to give me my alcohol. And then this part will give me my carboxylic acid, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the structure for acetosalicylic acid and look to see what the product molecules will be. The ester is the lower group, right? So this, oops. What will that give me? Does it give me the alcohol or the carboxylic acid? Carboxylic acid. How did you know that? It's the presence of this group. It's this double bonded oxygen. The part with the double bonded oxygen goes off to gives you the carboxylic acid. And then the alcohol is going to be given by this other group. That'll be giving my alcohol. So the acid, the carboxylic acid, has got two carbons on it. And then the ester, or the alcohol part, is actually a phenol.
So how do you recognize the carboxylic acid part? It's got that C double bond O on it. Okay. Well, that's not part of the ester, though, right? This is the this is a carboxylic acid part in itself. But this is the ester, and when the ester breaks apart, the part with the C double bond O goes to make the carboxylic acid, and the other part gives you your alcohol. Okay. So you divide, basically you divide from the ester part, and then you decide yeah. which one. Yeah, and in fact, you can just, if it's easier for you, just draw a line there, and then fill in OH on either side. Because that's what ends up happening. You get an OH on this side, and you get an OH on this side. So go back one slide and see that, okay? If you just get rid of the... Oh, hang on. So this is going to be a little weird, but I'm going to go ahead and try it and see how it works for you guys. So I'm just going to get rid of this part, okay? And then I get an OH on this side and an OH on this side. That's what the products are. Okay. That might be an easier way to see it. Okay. It makes the chemist in me cringe a little bit, but the, the memory part of me, probably that's how I probably remember it. So, okay. Does that make sense? I mean, you see how I did it? When you, when you decompose, that's what you're going to get. Can you explain it on the other one first? Yeah. One more time? On this one? Yeah. Yeah, so. You said that ester was the alcohol, right? The, 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 hang on, hang on. So let me erase real quick. Oh, actually, I'm going to erase this. And then I'm just, to get the products, I can put an OH here and an OH here. Okay. The part with the double bond on it, this goes to the carboxylic acid. So what I mean by this, I mean this whole thing goes to the carboxylic acid. And the other part... Adding water. Yeah, you're basically adding a water in there. Oh, it's already there, so you're just adding it. Yeah, you're adding an O and an H for the water and an H for the water. Too? This is when they separate, right? Yeah, this is the de decomposition or hydrolysis. They call it the hydrolysis of an ester. Um, the, the funny smell that you smell when aspirin goes bad is this, and that's acetic acid. So it actually an old aspirin bottle, if you open it up, smells like vinegar. Yeah, the S plus yeah, the yeah. So, yeah, and you saw what I did. I just erased the yeah. O. I'm learning how to ex communicate this stuff, just like you guys are trying to figure out what I'm saying. So, I'm just trying to find the best way to tell you. So, I sold you one way. The, the double bond goes to the ester side. The other way is you, if you just functionally you erase the O of the ester and put an OH on either end. That's yeah. those are the products. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It may not be soluble when it dissociates, but, yeah, probably would be in this case. Um, this is the last slide I'm going to cover, I think. Um, let me see. It's base hydrolysis. Base hydrolysis has another name. It's called saponification. Anybody ever heard that term before? Saponification. What's that? Yeah, saponified fats. Right? What they do, your, your, uh, your fats are triglycerides. And when you do a saponif, and those are three ester functional groups, and we'll learn this in the biochemistry part. But when you add sodium hydroxide to it, this is known as saponification. That's how we make soap. Okay? So you could take, literally take fat, 
mix sodium hydroxide into it, and then you get soap out of it. And we'll do that probably later this semester. Just, and then you add to, it's really harsh soap. It's the kind of soap that like makes your skin raw if you use it too much. So then they add things to it like glycerin and lanolin, and they add all these nice things. And then they make it smell good, so you could get esters and put esters in there if you really wanted to, I suppose. But usually not esters. Anyways, yeah. Base hydrolysis. Base hydrolysis is just like acid hydrolysis with one twist, okay? You still break it here, okay? You still get the alcohol out. What's the difference? You get a salt because it's in sodium hydroxide. You get the salt out instead of the acid. So you get the neutralized acid instead of the acid. So following this scheme that I've been telling you, if it's base hydrolysis, you can still do it as acid hydrolysis. You can erase this oxygen. You can put an OH on that side, so that part's still good. Okay? The other side, you just add the O. And then a minus, like that. So that gives you the ethanoate part of this molecule. Okay? And then because you use sodium hydroxide, the sodium is the cation that goes with the ethanoate ion. So if I'd use potassium hydroxide, it would have been potassium ethanoate instead. Okay. Questions? Just a lot of stuff to learn. Oh. Yeah, this is your book's notes on how to do it. So anyways, I'll skip that. So write a balanced chemical equation. This is the uh, study check, right? When methyl acetate reacts with water, heat, and acid catalyst. So I'm going to write the equation. So what's the first thing I have to do? I have to spell out, i got to draw methyl acetate, right? So I'm going to go ahead and just draw that part out for you. So that's methyl acetate. So I'm going to react it with water. Heat. And acid will be H plus. So that's what that is interpreted as. And now you have to fill out the product. What alcohol will I get out of the product? What's that? Not ethanol. Methanol, right? This, if you, again, just in terms of making this uh, fit with what I've been telling you, you would add an OH on this side and an OH on this side, right? Those would go in here. Sorry, it's a little small, but I didn't leave myself that much space. So then the alcohol would be HOCH3 or CH3OH. And then the acid would be CH3, C, double bond, O, and then because it's under acidic conditions, I end up with an OH. Can you just no, it doesn't matter. Okay, so what about KOH and heat? So let's draw the reactant. nice to have a little extra space to write when I do this.
Oh, is it, it's already balanced, by the way. When you write it out, <laughs> it says write the balance. So you think you have to balance it, but this reaction, these reactions both are balanced when you're done. So it's a one-to-one -one kind of relationship. Now, uh, KOH and heat, right? I'm still going to have the same alcohol. The only difference is I get the salt of the carboxylate. So this will be acetate. Um, and just so you know, you can write it like that. You don't have to always write all the double bond. I just do that to remind you what the structure is, OK? And then a minus charge, because it's the carboxylate. And what ion? Potassium. Okay. Yeah, you always have to show the negative charge. Good. The name is potassium. Potassium uh, ethanoate or or potassium acetate. Yeah. I just. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's Is okay. That right? It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. All right.